There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Amen. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name. God's love wake you up this morning. You came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites and even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done was nailed into your hand. Your love bled for me, oh, your blood in crimson streams, oh, your death is hell's to be, a cross meant to kill is my I've seen and tasted it, it's running through my veins, I can't escape its grip, and you 
my soul is saved. You cover takes away our sin, who takes away our sin, the Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again, makes us alive again, sing with us. i mm-hmm. 
to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King. Church. Thank you. All right. Once again, happy Father's Day today as the kids are headed out to Children's Church. Um, we're going to be starting our first ever sermon series in the book of Mark. After consulting with the specialist on Thursday, um, we, well, I came to the decision, and I think Glenn supports it, that um, I'm going to go ahead and with I'm going to go ahead with the chioplasty on my back. It's going to be tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at the Nevison Health Center. So please be in prayer for me. Thank you, thank you, Becky. Um, so we'll take a minute to pray for Miss Becky real quick. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, God, we're uh, thankful for the discernment and the wisdom that they're using uh, to make some of these hard medical decisions. And I, I pray, Father, for Miss Becky and, um, and the procedure, Lord God, that it would go well, that, that you would um, use the doctors, use uh, their wisdom, uh, but give them special wisdom, Lord God, through the power of your spirit, help them to have um, the knowledge and understanding. And, and we pray that it would go uh, quick and that... Um, she would heal quickly, Lord, and, and you're the king even over all the physical things in creation. And you're, you're the king over our bodies and our healing, and so we trust you with that, Lord God. And So heal her quick, Lord. We're thankful for her and her family, and it's your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be starting our first ever sermon series uh, in the book of Mark. So if you want to turn to Mark, uh, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. It's the second of the Gospels. 
uh, in order in the scriptures. And, um, and so we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. So this is going to be kind of an introductory sermon into the books. So we're going to lay a little bit of foundational work for the book of Mark. Um, but we're also going to see some really exciting truth in the scriptures. And I know for many of you, you remember what it was like to be a kid and... Uh, and obviously, if you have kids, you know what this feels like, but I don't know if you remember some of the greatest moments of anticipation in your life, uh, specifically the night before Christmas. The night before Christmas was the best time as a kid, and I remember struggling and struggling and struggling to sleep, uh, and then when I would finally fall asleep, I would wake up uh, super early, and I could not go back to sleep, and then I would come out and, and uh, see there was, there was stuff going on in the living room, my parents were getting stuff ready, and I remember uh, running back to my room thinking, it's not ready yet, John, it's not ready yet, but I remember feeling that, that feeling of anticipation, and, and those are some of, some of the best moments, but I also remember uh, one time uh, my, my dad was going to take me hunting for the first time, I think I was 14 or 15 years old, and I remember praying this prayer, and it was probably a, a very sinful prayer, possibly, um, but I prayed a prayer the night before going hunting. I was so excited. I said, God, please don't let me die in my sleep before I get to go hunting. I was, I was so worried that like God was going to strike me dead before I had the chance to go on a hunting trip. Uh, and so I would pray that prayer, God, please don't let me die before I get to go hunting. And of course, it was a wonderful, uh, it, it was a wonderful experience. But, but this is part of life, right? Anticipation, longing for something is built within us. And Mark is a, a wonderful book with this feeling in mind. Mark is a wonderful book because he comes in and makes a splash. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't waste any time. He jumps straight into Jesus' ministry at the very beginning. But the reason why this is so important, this feeling of anticipation is in all of us, is because we're in a broken world. Our world has been broken by sin, and so we long for things. We, we, long, we have a longing for something, and so many of us, our, our longings are placed on worldly things. Our, our longings are placed on, on things that are temporary, that do not last. And so that sense of longing and anticipation is in us, and we need to identify that in ourselves so that ultimately our longing would be realized, especially in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, that our longing is actually for the one that God sent, Jesus Christ. And he's the eternal one, the one that we actually would fill our longing, this desire that we have for more. So the main point today, Jesus is the one, and you can maybe add a little note next to that in your notes. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for, and he brings change. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for, and he brings change. Change. So the book of Mark is a wonderful book, and uh, it's it's actually really uh, uh, maybe many of us in this room don't realize. I actually, as I was studying, I don't think I realized this that much of this book is actually Peter uh, dictating to Mark as he was pinning the book of Mark. That that it was actually Mark was a disciple of Peter, so he kind of followed Peter around. And so a lot of this book, it's really fascinating. It's actually, uh, uh, you see a little bit of Peter's humility in the writing of this book because so many of the instances where Peter is depicted, a story that surrounds him, it's almost all the bad things that Peter did or said. It's not, all the, it's not any of the good moments that Peter had. And, and so you can kind of see this humility in wanting people to learn from his failings rather than from his, his victories or his successes. And so you can see some of Peter's humility in this, but as Mark is writing this book, it's really fascinating, but he's writing to Romans. He's writing to non, uh, his main audience was non-Jewish uh, Romans. They were Gentiles, those that were not considered to be the people of God at this time. And so he's writing this, and that's why a lot of the book of Mark is very simple. It's concise. It's short. Um, there's an urgency, a sense of urgency with the book where we're, we're jumping from scene to scene throughout the book of Mark. And the reason why is because he is reaching an audience that doesn't have insider language. 
So he's reaching an audience that doesn't have the old Jewish insider language. He's very simple and concise. He wants to get to the point. Um, and so there's a simplicity to this book. And this is just a quick aside. So um, this is a, a matter of personal preference. Um, often when we're discipling someone or we're encouraging someone to read a book of the Bible for the first time, if they're like, hey, I want to start. I want to start somewhere. Oftentimes, uh, it was when I grew up, it was always the book of John. That was always the, the, re- the recommendation was start with the book of John. Well, I'm actually going to push back on that a little bit. Um, and I think it's actually, there's a lot of wisdom in actually starting with the book of Mark. Uh, because it was written to a Gentile nation, uh, to a Gentile people that, was, that were not insiders in their language, it's very simple, it's concise, it's a shorter book of the Bible. And, uh, and I would say it's actually a better book. The book of John is awesome. If someone starts reading the, book, the Bible anywhere, that's awesome. Okay, I want to clarify that, you know, because it is all the word of God. Uh, but the book of John actually is very dense and deep theologically. So I actually lean towards the book of Mark in that, in that manner because of its simplicity. But this book is so wonderful because it jumps straight into the action. It gives a small little introductory statement, but it jumps right into Jesus' life and ministry. And so let's jump in. Point number one, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Let's start in verse one. Let's read this together. This is God's word to us today. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now, they jump in with an introduction. They uh, talk about this being the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, there's a lot packed in here. Gospel the word gospel here means good news, so this is the good news. This is the, the proclamation of what everyone has been waiting for. When it mentions the Son of God, you will notice it's a capital S on the word Son. That is actually Mark uh, declaring that Jesus is God in human flesh, that Jesus is God the Son. He is a member of the Trinity, and so, and so he is the one we have been waiting for. And so God the Son, um, he has existed for all eternity past. In fact, uh, this word, the beginning here, has its roots in Genesis chapter 1, and that's intentional. It's intentional because Jesus was there with God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son was there at creation when all things were spoken into existence. And so Jesus actually has his own hand in creation. And then, and then if you imagine the, 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 the audience uh, is, is, yes, Romans, but it's also, there's a mixture of Jewish people within this audience as well, even though the vast majority was probably Gentile. But there is this sense in which Jesus has come on the scene, and he was there at the beginning as well, and there's a tie-in, there's a, there's a season between the beginning and this moment where the people, the Jewish people, uh, throughout their history, ever since Genesis chapter 3, have been waiting and anticipating Jesus. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it talks about when, when God is speaking, the, the fall has happened, sin has entered the world, and God is speaking to, to the first man and woman, but he speaks directly to the serpent, Satan. He speaks directly to him, and he says, there is coming a day when the seed of the woman will come on the scene. Now, what does he mean by seed of the woman? What he means is that there is one coming who will come through a woman, and we know that as being Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, and he is, that seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And so ever since Genesis chapter 3, there has been thousands of years of the Israelite nation longing, and the rest of the world not realizing that they are longing, for the coming head crusher, the one who will crush the head of Satan. So ever since this moment, there has been thousands of years of Israelites sacrificing lambs, spilling the blood of sheep, and and they're doing so because they recognize our sin is destructive. Our sin has broken things. It's spilt blood, and there has to be a sacrifice for our sins. And so every time they would do that, they would kill an animal at the altar, they would then think, 
Lord, bring the one lamb to come and to spill his blood for all sins of all mankind. And so there is an anticipation in our world longing for this moment. Some people don't realize they're longing for this moment to come. And so Mark kicks this off basically by saying, look, we're anticipating what we were anticipating for all of history. And then all of a sudden, there's this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 40 is what's quoted here, and it says that there is coming one who is going to, he will prepare your way, the way of the Lord. He will prepare that way and make his paths straight. So he's talking about, and this prophecy is talking about John, John the Baptist, that we hear a lot of things about. Now, what's, what's really fascinating is that John has kind of stirred things up. John has stirred things up, and he is the one. He has a purpose. It was spoken of in Isaiah chapter 40. John is preparing the way for Jesus. He is setting the stage. I I don't know if if you guys uh, uh, know this about whenever they have, like, red carpet debuts. There is literally a red carpet. Like, I always thought that was just kind of a, a, a metaphor for something else. But they actually have a red carpet. And so they have guys who show up before the event, and they literally roll out this red carpet for the stars, the star of the show, everyone's been waiting, they've got their cameras ready, and then all the stars show up. Well, that's what John is doing. John is rolling out the red carpet, he's fulfilling this purpose to say, I'm preparing the way for the one that all eyes should be on him. And as he's doing this, it says in the scripture, um, later in the passage, we haven't gotten here yet, it says that all Judea and all Jerusalem were coming to see and experience this weird guy who is preaching in the wilderness that the Savior is coming, that he's here, that it's time to, it's time to start talking about this, it's time to start getting excited about this. And so it's literally a buzz in this community. So people are coming from all of you. You can imagine a setting kind of like this that we're sitting in right now where John the Baptist is standing up and he's proclaiming that Jesus is here, the Savior is here, the one we've all been waiting for. And, and so in much the same way, we can say Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So when he came on the scene, it was the moment all creation has been waiting for. Thousands of years of animals being slaughtered for the sins of the Jerusalem, uh, for the Jewish people, Jesus is here to be that lamb that we were all waiting for. And so uh, this is the moment Jesus comes on the scene. John fulfills his Old Testament prophecy, and then Jesus comes to fulfill the entire Old Testament. And he lives perfectly according to all of those things. He has to be perfect, the perfect lamb. Now, this brings us to point number two. Jesus is God the Son and the bringer of the new covenant. Now, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to skip around in the text. We're going to actually jump down to verses 7 and 8. And I'll explain in a minute why we're going to do that. But let's read verse 7. And he preached, saying, this is John, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now the reason why I'm taking this text out of order is because we're still describing Jesus. So John is still describing Jesus. Mark describes him at the beginning as the Lord, the one that we are paving the way for for the Lord to come. He is the Son of God. John goes on to explain why he's preaching. And so, and so we're going to see how John's life uh, changes because of what he believes about Jesus. But he continues to describe Jesus, and he does so in a peculiar way. After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, I want to clarify something, and I, I'm not a big feet person, so I, I think feet are disgusting, personally. You'll learn that about me. Um, in fact, I have to be very careful if, if, if I'm standing in a circle and I'm praying with people who are wearing sandals. I can, if I keep my eyes open during prayer, I can get really distracted by people's feet and ask questions like, why'd you make that toenail choice? I don't know why you made that toenail choice. Um, but feet kind of weird me out a little bit, okay? So y'all are, gonna, y'all are going to learn that about me. But, but if you can imagine during this time, people wore sandals everywhere in a desert climate. I cannot imagine the pedicures in biblical times must have been disgusting. But, but the point of, that, of saying that is there is something significant to what, what uh, Mark says here, what John says here, is he's saying this because the culture understands it. 
So when he says this, they fully understand what he means by what he's saying. So during this time, if someone of prominence was on the scene, a rabbi, they, they often called themselves rabbis, so a rabbi would be just a deep thinker, a wise person, someone who teaches like philosophically, or it might be someone who's an expert on the Old Testament and, and interprets the scriptures, or, or you know, someone who just is a wizened person. And oftentimes these rabbis, they would have disciples who would follow them. Now you can imagine the disciples of this time who would follow these rabbis, you can imagine them as like the towel boy, the water boy for the football team. So they were, they were people who would do the laundry. They would, so, so in this particular case, one of their, their, the ways that they showed honor to their rabbi is when the rabbi would walk in, there was usually a basin of water, there would be some rags, and their job as the disciple of these rabbis would be to stoop down on their knees in a very humble way, undo the sandals of this rabbi. And this was common, common practice. And then they would wash their feet. Ugh. They would wash their feet, okay? And so, and so this was a very almost humiliating action, but it was really culturally acceptable when a rabbi walks in the house to wash their feet. And what John is saying here, and when he, he, when he says this, he is saying, this leader, this king that is coming is so much greater than me I don't even deserve to wash his nasty feet that's how humble John was but that's also how great Jesus is he says he says this king this king that is coming is greater than all the other kings he's mightier than I I'm not even worthy to wash his feet and the reason why I'm not worthy is because he is going to come and do something greater than the world has ever seen he is going to take the world by storm with this crazy message that says to die to yourself and to live for Jesus. And, and he says this, and he's, he's putting Jesus, and notice this is so cool that John is modeling for us how he is not making much of himself. Like, like imagine how puffed up you could become if an entire countryside was coming to listen to your messages, how much that would build up your self-confidence and build up your own pride and, and especially today with social media, build your own brand and yet he continuously takes the spotlight off of himself and he puts it on Jesus because Jesus is worthy. Jesus is the son of God. He's the one that we make much of him and we, we decline ourselves. We set ourselves aside and we say, my life is about him. My life is about Jesus. And, and so Jesus, though, is gonna do something insane when he comes on the scene and here's here's how crazy this is so the new covenant the the people of israel were living under the old covenant where god's people were the israelite people and so when when they would uh when gentiles would want to be part of the israelite nation if they wanted to repent from their sins they had to actually cleanse themselves and take on the entire ritual and law of the old testament to become part of the jewish nation and people did do that. There were many who, who left behind an old life and they chose to be part of the Jewish Israel nation. And that was the old covenant. What Jesus is doing is bringing in a new covenant where there's one people. There's one people. There is no more Jew and Gentile. There is one people. All who place their faith and trust in Jesus are part of the family of God. That's the new covenant. And, and so when Jesus, when he says this, Paul says this, I'm baptizing you with water. I'm doing this simple thing. You think what I'm doing is amazing. What Jesus is going to do is to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to take a minute, so take off your whatever hat and put on your student hat because we're going we're gonna to do a little practical. So if you want to take notes, this was really helpful for me when I first learned this. But the Holy Spirit is God the Spirit, a member of the Trinity. I want to clarify that. And when, he, when, Paul, when John says this, he is actually declaring an Old Testament truth, something that everyone was longing for. So let's, let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a minute. So the Holy Spirit related to God's people differently in the Old Testament than the Holy Spirit relates to God's people today. So in the Old Testament, what we see, evidence in the Old Testament, is that the Holy Spirit would fill specific people for a specific amount of time with a specific purpose, okay? And so specific people, 
for a specific amount of time with a specific purpose. Now, the, the four categories of people, this is really fascinating, in the Old Testament that received the Holy Spirit for a, a specific period of time with a specific purpose, the four different people are the prophets, the judges, the kings and leaders of Israel, and then car- the carpenters who built the temple. Okay, so it's really interesting that, they, that God sent his spirit into these carpenters in the Old Testament. They had a specific job to do, and that was to build the temple according to God's specifications. And when God would do that, there was, there was this sense, even Moses mentions this in the Old Testament, that, that when he, at one point he was filled with the Spirit to do something, uh, do a specific task for God. And then he says in the Old Testament, I wish everyone could experience this. I wish everyone could experience what's, what it's like to have the presence of God. And then Joel chapter 2 is the prophecy, Joel 2, 28 through 29. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This is the prophecy of what Jesus does at Pentecost. And what Jesus does is he, he sends his spirit. He even says this, I leave you. He tells the disciples, I leave you because I'm going to... I'm going to ascend, and I'm going to leave you with God the Spirit to fill you. And so what happens when he says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, what he means by that is when we are confronted in our sin, when God convicts us of our sin for the first time, and we feel the conviction of the Spirit, we confess our sins to God, and we say, Jesus, I need you to save me from my sins. I need to be saved and forgiven from my sins. In that moment when you're saved... You are filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1 says that at the moment of our belief, we are given a deposit, the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing the day of redemption. And so the deposit that he gives us is the Holy Spirit. It is God the Spirit in us. And so the Holy Spirit is our helper He helps us as we study the scriptures. The Holy Spirit guides us. He convicts us of sin. He gives us gifts to use to serve the local church. The Holy Spirit gives us a sensitivity to speak truth to one another. The Holy Spirit can can bring supernatural comfort in the midst of suffering. And so there's actually this book, this popular book that came out not too long ago. And uh, and I won't mention any more about the book because it's a good book. But the main thing that stuck out to me is the title of the book. It was, a, it was a book called Forgotten God. And, and the title is so effective because it's so true that we talk a lot about God the Father and God the Son, and oftentimes we quickly forget that God the Holy Spirit is in us, that there's no longer an old temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we have been given the power of God in us, that God did not withhold from us his presence. And so now, because of what Christ has done for us, we have the power to proclaim freedom for the captives. We have the power to do ministry in the circles of our life. God has equipped us with what we need to say no to sin and yes to godliness. We have the Spirit filling us, and we so forget that we have a, a, a jet engine of strength inside of us. Now, point number three, this goes along with this, but having the Spirit, it brings change. It brings transformation. So when we believe Jesus is the Son, it changes what we live for. So let's look at John more closely, verse number four. This is why we're jumping backwards, because John's lifestyle is... The message he preaches and his lifestyle tells us a lot about what he thinks about Jesus. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. So let's see what he was preaching. He was 
John was preaching the forgiveness of sins. People were being convicted of their sins. They were repenting from their sins, which just means that whenever we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, we begin to confess our sins more, and we begin to repent from our sins on a daily basis. And we say, I'm done with that old life. I want to follow Christ into a new life with Jesus. And I want to look different. I want to look different than the world. And so that's, actually, we'll talk about this briefly, but that's one of the reasons we conduct baptism at Voice of Truth Church is because baptism is a physical picture of an inward reality. Baptism is a physical picture of what Christ has done for us, that when we go under the water, symbolically, we are dying to ourselves, our sin, our own agendas, our own life goals, and we are being raised to walk a new transformed life in Jesus Christ. And this water doesn't save. It doesn't have any any special power to save us. It is purely a representation of what Christ has done for us to encourage the believers and to remind us that we are walking in Christ's world, not our own. And so we, ha- we receive this transformation in Christ. And here's the deal. What's so funny about this story of John being clothed with camel's hair and wearing a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey, why is that even included? Like, why would, why would God give us this detail? Like, why was that significant? Now, I, I would say if you were retelling the story about someone, if you bumped into a guy who was wearing camel hair, and he's literally eating locusts and wild honey, you're going to tell that story to somebody. Like, that's going to stand out to you. And that's part of the reason that John was so, that's why the whole countryside was coming out to hear what he was preaching, because it's like, who's this crazy guy? This wild-looking animal dude out in the middle of the wilderness preaching this crazy message that all of a sudden there is a Savior who is on the scene, and we need to pay attention. Who is this guy? Well, why these details are significant is because at the end of the day, John truly believed that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the deliverer, the savior, God the son, to come and die on the cross for our sins and to give us a new purpose for living. See, John was living not for his clothing, his image. He was not living for food. He was not living for anything other than Jesus. He had a whole new purpose in life and he didn't care whether he was wearing Versace or designer clothes or whatever all he cared about was that the message was going forward he renounced the comforts of life and he and it's very significant that he was in the wilderness preaching these things and people were coming out to hear it and see it and we so so I want to I want to clarify this yes If we're studying the scriptures really closely, John the Baptist is serving a specific purpose according to the Old Testament. That Old Testament text that prophesied him in Isaiah chapter 40 is specifically about John. But, in much the same way, John is a hero of the faith and we are to imitate him. We're to follow his example. We are to be people who boldly proclaim that salvation can only be found in Jesus Christ. We are a redeemed people with a redeemed purpose for life. And it's not about our clothes, our bank accounts, our houses, our cars. It's about Jesus Christ and his glory alone. Christian today, this is where... The scriptures sting in a good way. But today, there might be some of us in this room that need to repent from busying our life with trite and mundane things and turn to make yourself busy shining the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this dark world. We need to repent from laziness and saying, I'll start tomorrow when you should have started 10 years ago. There's forgiveness for laziness. There's grace and mercy for those of us that maybe chicken out in a moment where we should be bold and brave. There's grace and forgiveness for those things. But Jesus is calling us to a greater calling. To open our mouths and to tell people that sin is real, that God is real, and that Jesus is the Savior that can reconcile us to God. John the Baptist 
clearly did not care about worldly things. He, cl- he cared about Jesus. And so today, maybe there's someone in this room that says, I want that. I want that Holy Spirit. I want to be part of the family of God. I want to have that kind of purpose, to not live for temporary things. Well, today, you can place your faith and trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. And much like, much like you trusted and had faith in that chair that you sat in, that it would hold you up in much the same way, that's how you sit in the arms of Jesus and, and receive his salvation and, and, and fall in his arms and trust in him with all your sin, all your mess. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Jesus. John clearly didn't clean himself up to come to Jesus. He didn't adjust his diet to come to Jesus. And so today there might be someone in this room that today is the day for you to experience salvation in Christ alone instead of other things in this world. So we're going to take a few minutes as the band comes up to close out. We're going to take a few minutes uh, and pray. If you have someone in your life that you want to come to the altar and and pray for their soul, pray for their salvation. If you want to come down, I'll be down front here if you want to come and talk to me about what it means to place your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time. Maybe some of us need to come to the altar and confess our sin, confess our laziness, confess that we've just been so busy trying to make our lives better that we're not making Christ's name known. And so let's take this moment, just silence, and I'll, I'll, I'll close us in prayer before we sing. But if you want to come forward and pray or pray with me, we can do that now. Thank you.
we thank you so much for this uh, opportunity we have and the privilege and even the responsibility we have, Lord, to be here and to worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you for your word, God. We thank you for uh, Pastor John today and preaching your word. And we just thank you again for the fellowship and the love we can have for one another. Lord, I ask you to bless the food that's been prepared. Bless our week, Lord, and uh, let it be uh, bring you glory. We ask God this in Jesus' name. Amen.